Hello everyone. Welcome to Homemaking Radio, a place where you can listen while you get something done at home. I'm Lydia Ruth and I am a veteran homemaker. I've been married for 52 years and I also homeschooled my children, but I talk about many different things. So if you're not a homeschooler or you don't so you, there will still be something here for you to listen to and today I'm going to be doing poetry that has meaning that helps in whatever you're trying to do and I know it's the new school year for many people even the homeschoolers have gotten their list and are getting things for themselves and I don't have any children at home anymore and I'm a grandmother but I made a list for myself of a curriculum and I've ordered a couple of books and I'll be sharing some of the things with you and so this year I hope to paint a picture, write a story, make a magazine for my granddaughter, I hope to uh, get a new handwriting book and practice my handwriting and also learn a couple of new skills and I have uh, looked a lot of it up. I can get some of it for free. And so today I just want to, to start out by saying that the best way to start any kind of a day, whether you're just uh, staying home and not planning to see anybody, is to get dressed and get, I call it preparation, get, get your bathing done. It's like a new canvas and get your uh, hair done and be happy with yourself. Look in the mirror and uh, be more careful about how you look because it has a bearing on how you serve your home and others and I remember talking to some women who were saying that in the olden days people who are vital call it the olden days it doesn't seem so long ago but they told me that they remembered when just going on a little vacation that was local maybe down to their local beach or on a trip to a river or a place where they went every summer that they got special clothes summer clothes you know they get their new shirts and their new um, their new canvas shoes and uh, I remember us ordering different in those days you could get these different colored canvas shoes they called them tennis shoes and you could order them in different colors and you'd get a shirt to match and uh, we, we had they had all their new things and they were excited about their vacation and they wanted to look nice and they had all their things that they would use to freshen up for the day and even when they were camping they were careful about the clothing that they wore because they knew that it set the tone for their mood and for what they were trying to do and the enjoyment that they would have and I know some women that today say they can't even clean a sink unless they are fully dressed you know having got a good start to the day and had their list and their cup of whatever and they can't they can't even focus until they do that I think that it does have a big bearing on how we think and I one of my books for for my own um, education this year my own thinking this year is if I can find it here what I did with it hmm is uh, I'm going to use the chapter the mind body connection in the Jane Austen diet book which this is just a lifestyle book it's not really about a diet there's no diet in here but it's about a lifestyle that creates health and the mind body connection is an important part of this I have been reading some of it to you but today I have poetry and poetry uh, was so powerful when I was raising my children um, Isaac Isaac, oh, yeah. could you shut that door, please? The traffic is, the tractors are too loud. I can't hear myself. I have uh, one of my grandchildren here with me um, for a little while, and he's my, he's my butler. <laughs> he does things for me. So anyway, thank you, darling. Um, the Poetry is very important in when you have, if some of you have children at home or you're raising them, and I'm going to read you some poetry about little children and older children and people that need encouragement. So even if you have no children at home, this is still for you. You can still take it in. There's something in each poem for you to consider. I really think that they are, there are values in them 
that are important for you. And uh, even if you don't have children at home, this is for everyone. So I'm going to start out with one called, um, I'm going to start out with the youngest poems and kind of work up to the next one. And this is for a mother of young children and it's a prayer. Um, I will try to at least put the titles of these poems so that you can look them up yourself. Maybe you could run them off, make yourself a little book, okay? And because these are poems about life. And ladies, I have learned that YouTube, because I didn't qualify for monetization and didn't have the option of clicking off ads, YouTube has put ads on my uh, speeches here. But you can go to my blog where I have embedded this video and you can listen to it ad free. So the link is in the description box below the video. Please go over there and that way you get to see the pictures that go with and all the books and things that I've mentioned. Um, and I know some people would rather not listen. I've gotten where I'm really impatient with listening to or watching videos and I just want to read through something. Um, so I'd rather read through a recipe than listen to it or watch it. It's getting to that point. So I do want to do some more writing for you and for those who'd rather just read because it's quieter. So I'm going to start out with the Mother's Prayer. And this is important for everybody because it addresses the concept of rushing uh, people and uh, being annoyed. And the, the next prayer, the next uh, poem will too. Who taught us to hurry so much. I know uh, God tells us in the New Testament and the Old Testament to do things when it's time to do them. To do them on time. And um, be times, I think, means on time or at the moment or when it's necessary. But who taught us to create so much anxiety over rushing? And we do have to learn patience. So let me read this to you. Give me patience when little hands tug at me with ceaseless small demands. Give me gentle words and smiling eyes, and keep my lips from hasty sharp replies. Let me not in weariness, confusion, or noise obscure my vision from life's fleeting joys. That when in years to come my house with beautiful memories its rooms may fill. Uh, there are some versions of this that says no sad memories its rooms may feel. Uh, you might look look this up. It's called Oh Give Me Patience When Little Hands. So I wanted to talk about that just a, a tiny bit and that is that uh, to be to be patient means that they are they don't have the wisdom that you have no matter what their age is if you're their mother uh, they have a, a certain immaturity still and they will say and do things that can crush you even when they're older and you've got to realize that you would never do that to them but they are doing it out of their immaturity and whatever they say and do will if they don't realize it and don't repent of it then it will be heaped back on them by someone else so don't be too upset uh, when the uh, the little ones especially uh, don't know what they're doing they are too young and there's no point in arguing with little children uh, and so it says here give me patience when little hands tug at me with ceaseless small demands when a child comes and tugs at you it's best to pay attention because they'll learn to trust you they know you will pay attention and too often I think we we are, our minds are off in a daze somewhere and a child comes and says something to us over and over and finally starts to cry or weep or scream or grab you or in frustration because the mother is off in a daze and doesn't answer and then they get in trouble. The children get in trouble because they knock something over in their anxiety and the mother's attitude made them anxious. So it's better when they come to pay attention to what their needs are. And uh, we've all grown up in a society that says, you know, don't spoil anybody, but it never spoils children to have kind words and smiling eyes and keep your lips from hasty, sharp replies. That is a habit that the children will pick up and one day you'll really regret it. And we all know grown women of a vital age who are full of it, uh, hasty, sharp replies that 
that just slay you. So we don't want to develop that in them. And to a great extent, having a family and especially homeschooling is of great benefit to the mother and the parents because they learn that they will be the teachers these children will be imitating. They'll be imitating your attitude and your words. And so we are the biggest learners in this. In fact, I love I love homeschooling so much. I'm just going to go ahead and get my stuff. And I've even got a new book, and I wanted to show you uh, this artist book. It's called a sketchbook, and I got it from the Dollar Tree. So for a dollar twenty-five, I get really good paper. And in the beginning of each, these are all different on the covers, and uh, they'll show you how to sketch what they have put here on this cover. But I think a really good sketchbook is important, and at least introduce them to the idea and you can go to places like Costco sometimes and get sketchbooks or drawing instruction books and paint supplies. Um, there is uh, wisdom and learning out there in many different places not just the homeschool catalogs but one thing I will tell some of you who are starting homeschooling that are feeling a little pressured or anxious about it that all goes away when you get these things in the mail and you start looking through them you start looking through these books and you see things that are absolutely uh, delightful and and beneficial and uh, edifying and building to the soul and you start reading and you say oh come here children let let me read this I didn't know this and next thing you know you are homeschooling before you even know it so don't worry too much about it and parents will figure out what the needs of their children are and they will be able to address it. When they're gone all day to a school, they don't see the, those little moments. So now I'm going to read the other poem. Um, and it's called Making a Man by Nixon Waterman. It's always been one of my favorite. And I think that it transcends the age group because it's talking again about rushing. Rushing people, trying to... I don't know who put this uh, you've got to succeed thing in us, but... Isn't a quiet life a success and isn't a steadiness and uh, an honesty and a purposefulness in life just as much of a success as these people that rush around trying to climb the ladder of success? Let me read this to you because even if you don't have children at home, this, this is so important because there's a deeper meaning besides the baby. Hurry the baby as fast as you can. Hurry him, worry him, make him a man. Off with his baby clothes, get him in pants, feed him on brain foods and make him advance. Hustle him soon, he's able to walk. Into a grammar school, cram him with talk. Fill his poor head full of figures and facts. Keep on a jamming them in till it cracks. Once boys grew up in a rational rate, now we develop a man while you wait. Rush him through college, compel him to grab of every known subject a dip or a dab. Get him in business and after the cash, all by the time he can grow a mustache. Let him forget he was ever a boy. Make gold his god and its jingle his joy. Keep him a hustling and clear out of breath until he wins nervous prostration and death. What a shame it is that we have in any way hurried our children. Let them uh, grow at a rational rate. If they're having trouble with anything, whether it's speaking, you know, a lot of children can't say their R's or their T's or their S's or there'll be some, some vowel that they can't manage. Don't put them in therapy. Uh, just let them hang around with the parents. The parents, eventually, uh, they will be able to handle it and be able to learn. But some people's you know, our brain isn't ready for the learning that the public school has said. You have to know this by the time you're six and you have to know this by your time you're seven. That's not true. That's not true. Some of us didn't learn our basic uh, way to figure math out until we were much older. Uh, it is taught so early sometimes I think it's too much for their, for their heads. And let them learn at a rational rate and let them want to learn. And uh, so this is such a beautiful poem. And I will put that one on for you. Okay, so now we want to go to the Discouraged Child poem. And these are for you too, even if you don't have children. This is to listen to while you work. And 
One of the purposes of poetry is that it gives a rhythm that's easy to remember. Uh, you know, as your heart has a rhythm and your pressure has kind of a rhythm uh, to memorize poems as, uh, as a way to settle the mind and to, and to make you think logically and uh, I would say to keep you from feeling disjointed and scatterbrained. So that's the importance of a poem. So let's talk about this poem. And it's uh, about uh, people who become discouraged, okay? And it's, it's for children, but it's just ex excellent for all of us. And if you've missed this and, uh, and you're now uh, wanting me to homeschool you, then here it is. Do something for somebody quick. Be careful with this, though, because we as homemakers and mothers tend to go overboard sometimes, neglect our own homes, um, trying to reach out and do something for somebody. But remember, the home and doing something for people uh, in your own family is the most important. There's an excellent rule I have learned in life's school, and I'm ready to set it before you. When you're heavy at heart and your world falls apart, do not pity yourself, I implore you. No, up with your chin, me bad luck with a grin, and try this infallible trick. It will never fail you, whatever may ail you. Do something for somebody quick. Oh, do something for somebody quick. It will banish your cares in a tick. Don't fret about you. There's a good deed to do. Do something for somebody quick. And certainly we have found when everybody gets a little bit discouraged or mopey to go and clean something always settles your mind or to go and help somebody else in the family with some some problem that they have uh, is is so beneficial for yourself so here's another one called uh, suppose by Phoebe Carey and I will try to uh, put these all in in a list online on uh, the post and if you would please go and listen to this on the post because the list will be there hopefully of all these poems so this is suppose suppose my little lady your doll should break her head these are for people that fall apart when things go wrong I tell you what when I between the ages of maybe six to nine or even older I couldn't handle <laughs> discouragement I cried so easily because I would get up in the morning in these beautiful morning and then of course I was in a large family mostly boys and then somebody would take something that I owned and, and break it or tear it or I would it would be lost or uh, it, it was just hard to for me to navigate through all that suppose my little lady your doll should break her head could you make it whole by crying till your eyes and nose are red? And wouldn't it be pleasanter to treat it as a joke and say you're glad twas Dolly's head and not your head that broke? <laughs> Suppose you're dressed for walking and the rain comes pouring down. Will it clear off any sooner because you scold and frown? And wouldn't it be nicer for you to smile than pout and so to make sunshine in the house when there is none without. Suppose your task, my little man, is very hard to get. Will it make it any easier for you to sit and fret? And wouldn't it be wiser than waiting like a dunce to go to work in earnest and learn the thing at once? Suppose that some boys have a horse and some a coach and pair. Will it tire you less while walking to say it isn't fair? And wouldn't it be nobler to keep your temper sweet and in your heart be thankful that you can walk upon your feet? And suppose the world don't please you, nor the way some people do. Do you think the whole creation will be altered just for you? And isn't it, my boy or girl, the wisest, bravest plan, whatever comes or doesn't come, to do the best you can? I could tell you a lot of stories that go with uh, the thoughts in this poem. Of course, we should be... Um, gentle with people who have had a disappointment in their crying and uh, let them do their crying but that after that they need to um, look at it philosophically and in a different way and of course if my child's uh, toy broke I'd figure out how to fix it. I'd say let's figure out how to fix it or we would figure out how to replace it 
all will be well. And uh, then uh, there's this other one. Um, suppose you're dressed for walking and the rain comes pouring down. Uh, and I'm trying to think where I, where I kind of connect this with something. Um, and that was, I, I believe it was a movie I saw where there was a thunderstorm and everyone was out in a carriage going to go on a picnic and some people were just terrified of the thunder and lightning and the man that was with them says, do you think that this thunder and lightning has come just to destroy you and me? <laughs> you know. Um, and I like this one. Suppose that some boys have a horse and some a coach and pair. That's talking about uh, a wagon or a coach with a pair of horses. Um, and wouldn't it be more sweet in your heart to be thankful you can walk upon your feet. How fun we used to enjoy this because the old people of my day, when they got together, would talk about how much better off they were now, even with their cars that wouldn't start or would break down on the road. I don't think I've seen very many breakdowns anymore, but in the old days you could break down. And they would t still talk about how they were so poor uh, that they didn't have shoes or they did have shoes and they carried them on the way to town and then put them on before they went into a shop or then they would start to outpour one another. I really used to laugh at this where they would say well that's nothing um, we didn't have shoes or then they would just go on and on and be absolutely ridiculous saying well we didn't have feet or we didn't have this or we didn't have that and just make it they just we used to call it outpouring one another but that's what the old people used to do and they thought they were pretty well off so now I want to read and this one was called suppose and then I want to read um, this one called don't worry little girl by Albert Edgar Albert Guest and I'm just going to read about uh, the part where he talks about his wife and I will just list the name of the poem don't you worry wife of mine don't you ever show a sign of grim care laugh and sing your way along all the grief and all the wrong I can bear for a long life's dusty miles I have need of all your smiles I have need of all your laughter let it ring from floor to rafter you know what a rafter is uh, let it uh, for in all I say or do, all my cheer must come from you. That's encouraging a wife at home, a woman at home, not to take in the stress of the world. He'll take it in. He says, he's a husband. He says he'll take it in. And there's another one he wrote called Leave It at the Door, where the father and husband uh, is admonished. You know, he's walking home. He's tired. His tie is loosened. He takes his hat off. He's weary. He's walking towards the door and he talks about all the grime and all the grim stories and all the bad news and all the cutting each other down at work. Just leave it at the door. You don't you dare sully your house or poison your family with any of that stuff. And uh, it's called Leave It at the Door. And I'll list that too. And, um, or maybe I could just find it for you. Well, I can't find it right now. Um, Edgar A. Guest, leave it at the door. I'm still here. Okay. Well, I'd like to. Uh, it's called at the door, not leave it at the door. So uh, that's why I couldn't find it at the door. He wiped his shoes before his door, but ere he entered, he did more. Twas not enough to cleanse his feet of dirt they gathered in the street. You must teach your children how to read poetry. If there's no comma, you complete the sentence even though the stanza is in a rhyming um, order. You've got to learn to read it uh, so that the 
sentences complete. He wiped his shoes before his door, but ere he entered he did more. "'Twas not enough to cleanse his feet of dirt they'd gathered in the street. "'He stood and dusted off his mind, and left all trace of care behind. "'In here I will not take,' said he, "'the stains the day has brought to me. "'Beyond this door I shall never go the burdens that are mine to know. "'The day is done, and here I leave the petty things that vex and grieve. "'What clings to me of hate and sin, to them I will not carry in.' Only the good shall go with me for their devoted eyes to see. I will not burden them with cares, nor track the home with grim affairs. I will not at my table sit with soul unclean and mind unfit. Beyond this door I will not take the outward signs of inward ache. I will not take a dreary mind into this house for them to find. He wiped his shoes before his door, but paused to do a little more. He dusted off the strains of strife, the mud that's indecent to life, the blemishes of careless thought, the traces of the fight he'd fought, the selfish humors and the mean, and when he entered he was clean. So that was called At the Door. And uh, I wanted to read two poems from that my children liked that that helped so much and one was called little things because people get discouraged and even if this is not to children maybe it would be for you how to look at a lo a large job and uh this is called little things little drops of water little grains of sand make the mighty ocean and the pleasant land so the little minutes, humble though they be, make the mighty ages of eternity. It's by Julia A. Fletcher. And it's about how the how the uh small little small movements and moment and improvement can dig into something to make it a final clean up a huge mess or accomplish a goal that you have. So here's one called patiently thought to thought and thought by thought and I think it's about life and it's about growing up and it's about how life works. Patiently thought by thought old habits are untaught. We watch but cannot see the seed invisibly become the oak or pine or warm fall fruiting vine. We see the stature gained, we see the growth attained, but we cannot see things grow. The process is too slow. Things have a time to root, a time to flower and to fruit, a time to stand and rest, and every time is best. Waiting is also growth. Living consists of both. Patiently, thought by thought, old habits are untaught. New ways of life, life are wrought. And that's W-R-O-U-G-H-T. Formed, it means formed. So let me continue with these poems I have collected here for you uh, how to be happy now this goes along with that other poem I read about doing something for somebody quick I think uh, that it's a slightly different from the last one it's almost the same one are you almost disgusted with life, little man? I'll tell you a wonderful trick that will bring you contentment if anything can. Do something for somebody quick. Are you awfully tired with play, little girl, weary, discouraged, and sick? I'll tell you with the loveliest game in the world. Do something for somebody quick. Though it rains like the rain of the flood, little man, and the clouds are forbidding and thick, you can make the sun shine in your soul, little man. Do something for somebody quick. Though the stars are like brass overhead, little girl, and the walks like a well-heated brick, and our earthly affairs in a terrible whirl. Do something for somebody quick. That had a slightly different wording to the original one that I read to you, so I wanted to read it to you again. Okay. And here's one that meant a lot to my children. I slept and dreamed that life was beauty. I woke and found that life was duty. Was thy dream then a shadowy lie? Toil on, said heart, 
unceasing lie, and thou, or some say, courageous lie, and thou shalt find thy dream to be a noonday light and truth to thee. And then many people have put this on their blogs and explained it to mean that we're all looking for beauty and peace and rest, and it's achieved by doing our duty. Uh, it's nothing feels better than having uh, worked hard and gotten things done. And so it gives us purpose in life. Okay, so here's another one. The man who thinks he can. Now, when it says beaten, it just means if you think uh, you are, um, if it think if if you are, um, it's not discouraged. But uh, I'm trying to think of a synonym for beaten. If you think you have lost, you know, so defeated. It means defeated. If you think you are beaten, you are. If you think you dare not, you don't. If you'd like to win, but you think you can't, it's almost certain you won't. If you think you'll lose, you're lost. For out in the world we find success begins with a fellow's will. It's all in the state of mind. If you think you're outclassed, you are. You've got to think high to rise. You've got to be sure of yourself before you can ever win a prize. Life's battles don't always go to the stronger or faster man, but soon, sooner or later, the man who thinks he can, man who wins, is the man who thinks he can, and this also has to be taken in consideration. Yes, if you want to do something, uh, if you think you can, you can. But if it's something that you don't have, you find out you don't have the ability to do, or you're not interested in. Uh, some of these positive poems aren't going to help. You can force yourself into something that you're not interested in, I'm sure. But uh, interest has a lot to do with it, too. Okay, here's another one. It's, a le it's called Try, Try Again. And I believe you could probably find all these and more and print them out and make a little uh, notebook for your children and read some of these every day and discuss them. It's a lesson you should heed. Try, try again. If at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Then your courage should appear, for if you will persevere, you're, you will conquer, never fear. Try, try again. Once or twice, though, you should fail. Try, try again. If you would at last prevail, try, try again. If we strive, tis no disgrace, though we do not win the race. What should you do in that case? Try, try again. If you find your task is hard, try, try again. Time will bring you your reward. Try, try again. All that other folks can do, why with patience should not you? Only keep this rule in view. Try, try again. And, of course, it's talking about staying in the race, and I suppose that means... Two, if you have a character problem you're trying to overcome, I think uh, probably uh, being careful and neat and tidy might be a lot of people's problems. We've been taught to hurry, throw things down and leave. And everyone's always hurrying us. Uh, don't worry about folding that. We've got to get going. Or don't worry about uh, putting that away. You can put that away later. Let's just do this. Uh, and we are taught to hurry. It is so sad. Uh, we're not allowed to take our time and to think about what we're doing. And that could be the source of a lot of the anxiety that goes on in a, women, in a woman's life, really. <clears throat> and here's another one. When things go wrong, as they sometimes will, when the road you're trudging seems all uphill, when the funds are low and the debts are high and you want to smile but you have to sigh, when care is pressing you down a bit, rest if you must, but don't you quit. Life is queer with its twists and turns, as every one of us sometimes learns, and many a fellow turns about when he might have won had he stuck it out. Don't give up, though the pace seems slow, you may succeed with another blow. Often the goal is nearer than it seems to a faint and faltering man. Often the struggler has given up when he might have captured the victor's cup, and he learned too late when the night came down how close he was to the golden crown. Success is failure turned inside out, the silver tint in the clouds of doubt. And you can never tell how close you are. It might be near when it seems afar. So stick to the fight when your heart is hit. It's when things seem worst that you must not quit. Okay. 
it couldn't be done by Edgar Albert Guess. And surely all of these poems can be taken into consideration in some way with uh, developing character in yourself and in your children. And like I said, it's the mother that's going to develop the most character. Somebody said it couldn't be done, but he, with a chuckle, replied that maybe it couldn't, but he would be one who wouldn't say so till he tried. So he buckled right in with the trace of a grin on his face. If he worried, he hid it. He started to sing as he tackled the thing that couldn't be done, and he did it. Somebody scoffed, oh, you'll never do that. At least no one ever has done it. But he took off his coat and he took off his hat, and the first thing we knew, he'd begun it. With a lift of his chin and a bit of a grin, without any doubting or quit it, he started to sing as he tackled the thing that couldn't be done, and he did it. There are thousands to tell you it cannot be done. There are thousands to prophesy failure. There are thousands to point out to you one by one the dangers that wait to assail you. Just buckle in with a bit of a grin. Take off your coat and go to it. Just start to sing as you tackle the thing that cannot be done and you'll do it. I uh, had one or two children that would be upset when they couldn't get something uh, right or they couldn't get something done or they couldn't fix something or uh, a toy would not work the way it should or they couldn't draw the way they wanted to and I taught them this poem just little by little and we turned it into a song we just picked up a, uh, a tune that kind of went with it that that managed the uh, poetry well and we turned it into a song and just uh, sentence by sentence daily a different sentence every day till they had memorized it and taught the, them to avoid uh, too much of a meltdown or too much frustration. Crying is actually pretty good because you're learning. If you're learning something new, you tend to cry, <laughs> uh, but uh, but not to give up. And uh, so I taught them this, and this this became one of their favorites. So let me see. Uh, this other one is worthwhile. It's called worthwhile. Absolutely one of my favorites. Um, it's easy enough to be pleasant when life flows by like a song. But the man worthwhile is the one who will smile when everything goes dead wrong. For the test of the heart is trouble, and it always comes over the years. And the smile that is worth the praises of earth is the smile that shines through tears. It's easy enough to be prudent when nothing tempts you to stray. When without or within no voice of sin is luring your soul away. But it's only a negative virtue until it's tried by fire. And the life that is worth the honor on earth is the one that resists desire. By the cynic, the sad, the fallen, who had no strength for the strife. The world's highway is cumbered today. They make up the sum of life. But the virtue that conquers passion and the sorrow that hides in a smile is these that are worth the homage of earth for we find them but once in a while uh, by Ella Wheeler Wilcox. Now I believe that all of these poems can give us some kind of uh, some kind of thought of keeping from being too discouraged. It's normal to be discouraged but to get so discouraged that you cannot live uh, is not healthy at all and sometimes the poetry can help. So I hope that some of it will be of value to you. And I wanted to share uh, my new books for uh, this year's curriculum. I just ordered them for me. I always wanted them. And I used to see them in gift stores, but they were terribly expensive. I can't. Let me see if they've got the original price on them. I don't know, but they were very expensive at the time. Uh, A Little Book of Manners for Girls by Emily Barnes and illustration illustrated by someone else. And uh, I'll just read a, a little part in it for you so you know what it is. But I think it's good for us, too. We need to learn these things. Um, I think it's really important for older women to be careful what they say, what they talk about, how much they reveal when they're with other women. They tend to, uh, unfortunately, and I'm so sad to say that sometimes even in Christian circles, women start talking about things they shouldn't be talking about. I think it's best to... Uh, ask God to put a seal on your lips, put a put a gate on your words, uh, because the less you say, the absolute better. And of course, 
At first it makes people uncomfortable when you don't comment on every single little thing and you don't contribute. Uh, sometimes, you know, there was a era where there was a trend for people to get together and start talking about all their problems and all their failures. And when you didn't say anything, they thought you were being dishonest or you were hiding something. But actually, we have our privacy. And we never like to talk about things that weren't edifying. Edify means to build up and to improve the mind and to make somebody else's life better. And so we didn't talk about our uh, things that were depressing or about our failures. So this is called uh, Don't Make a Big Deal About It. If I notice something embarrassing the other person, embarrassing that the other person does not know, maybe she has something caught in her teeth or a big stain on the back of her shirt. I don't mention it in public. I wait till we're alone and I tell her in a quiet, friendly voice. Sometimes I say, excuse me, could I talk to you over here? But I don't make a big deal about it. That could even be more embarrassing than the teeth or the stain. That is such good advice. We've got to teach uh, our children to be careful about what they say, but it all starts with us because we're going to be the pattern that they follow if they're not uh, watching a lot of media. Media's terrible, isn't it? Just let's tell, let's tell it all, you know? So then we have a book of manners for boys. Uh, for boys. Uh, and this is the one we wanted the most. There were more boys in our family than girls. And uh, so, so why do manners matter? So I'll just read the first page of this, Why Do Manners Matter? And like I say, when you get these books, then you start to see some meaning to life, how this is going to help your family life. And sit down uh, and make some goals for your children. We hope by the, by the time you are 18, you will be a well-mannered young man because we don't want our daughter-in-law to hate us your wife to hate us because we didn't teach you any manners so he needs to learn manners with his sister and his mother and everyone else in the home even with the pets uh, because this forms his attitudes when he is married in his own home so in a sense you are setting him up for uh, success or failure in his his own uh, family life so this is why this is so important if you want to socialize your children do it the manners way because manners makes them acceptable from uh, elderly people to little children they'll be able to socialize with all different age groups uh, and uh, they will be well-rounded so so why do manners matter mind your manners Grammy says for what seems like the 47th time during your weekend visit remember your manners in my day manners mattered grumbles dad at the dinner table so what are manners anyway? How do you mind them? And why do they matter? Manners might sound like some kind of silly old-fashioned thing, but they're not. Manners are the accepted or right way people do things when they're with other people. I've always said it's just trying to make uh, other people to be kind to other people and to don't do things that make them uncomfortable. They were made up by families and cultures to make life more fun for everyone. For instance, when two Americans meet, it's good manners for them to shake hands. In some countries, they bow. What if tugging on each other's earlobes and spinning around three times in a circle was the right way to greet something, someone? Well, we might have to do that. Manner seems like something your parents practice at a fancy dinner party or the way they act when they become president. But manners come into play in your life. Let's say you're all out at recess or at the park where there are no lines and no, uh, no grown-ups to watch or set rules for the games. What would happen? And then it goes on to how you can be polite when you're playing with someone else and there's no uh, adults around. What do you do? Uh, people with good manners are fun to be around. They care about being nice and fair to other people. And so, if you have this, this is uh, quite a treasure. I would say, I always wish, when I got books for my kids, we only got one copy of everything. Well, when they grew up, they were so fond of them, they took the books. So what I wish now is I had ordered two, one for my library and one for theirs, but I'm finding them on the web now. Some of them reprinted brand new. And so, 
uh, they they just make your life uh, full of meaning and so much richer. And the Emily Barnes book are rich in rich in um, scriptural values too. Um, so the next one I ordered, and these are for myself. It must be wonderful to be a boy. I keep finding these books for boys. Diary of an American Boy. Now, if you're from another country or in another country, this is still nice because it all these things happened in an era where it was similar in in every country. And the one that I uh, the page that I found, remember I had posted something uh, during our summer camp here at the Mass that one of the grandchildren did and he had wanted to make homemade inks that he could dip a feather uh, the tip of a feather quill in and write himself so I, I let him use some cocoa powder and water and he did a pretty good job but it has a homemade ink recipe and here it is um, boiled down walnut to make brown ink boiled down walnut or butternut holes that have been mashed first. Add vinegar and salt to boiling water to set it. Hmm. Black ink. Add indigo or lamp black, which is soot. I don't know if we have soot anymore. Blue. Powdered indigo, two parts uh, and one part bran. Mix with water, let stand, then strain it well. Well, we found a lot of other things that we had in the spice cabinet that we could work, work with. And then uh, it talks about how to make a just simple things uh, how to make a window it also the drawings are just wonderful and um, I just kind of was flipping through it even how to make a bridge and I can remember growing up on the homestead when we all tried to make a little bridge just a little tiny bridge out of the wood that was laying around sticks or things from trees just laid, a, laid it around and then walked across it and there might have even been some water going under it and um, how to stack wood so that it will not fall down <laughs> and uh, we pick up little pieces of wood and stack it and so some of this I remember it's kind of very accurate and I, I can't wait to read it and so just before you go I have about 10 more minutes and I want to read uh, some of Brian Kozlowski's book on the mind-body connection. I think it's very important to take care of our bodies and people are obsessed with their health and I don't blame them. Uh, trying to get to the bottom of why they don't feel well or why their bodies are breaking down, that's very important. But the mind is so important to, uh, in that process. So remember I had read last time about Eleanor so I will he talks about the books that Jane Austen wrote, Pride and Prejudice, Sense and Sensibility, Emma, um, Persuasion, and Mansfield Park, and several others. I think she wrote six or seven. And I had repeated one about the lady that uh, Jane, that uh, Anne went to see in Persuasion that was just all crippled up, but she was cheerful. And... Uh, her name was Mrs. Smith. I had emphasized that last time. So I'll say it uh, again. I'll read again about Eleanor here. Eleanor and Mary Ann. A case study. Throughout Sense and Sensibility, Austin asks us to consider, see if you've got a young girl that's wanting to know, are there any books that she could read? There are plenty. You can go to um, thrift books and you can find books about young uh, boys or girls traveling, uh, you know, in the olden times or that are very wholesome. And you can find a lot on um, historical stories. But... Uh, we found the Jane Austen books in a dollar store when we first, when when the dollar stores first came out and used those. And because uh, my daughter wanted to read something, and we had Anne of Green Gables too, and all of Ellen Montgomery's books. They all have their flaws, but if you teach a child to take it into consideration, to what matters in life and what the scriptures say and what God uh, requires of us, then you can understand all these things. 
Um, Throughout Sense and Sensibility, Austin asks us to consider the important question. Is it better to frequently release our sorrows, like Marianne, or try to subdue them, like Eleanor? Remember, they always had a conflict between those two girls. Eleanor, you're always so staid and settled, and you never reveal how you really feel. And then Marianne is just like sobbing and letting it all hang out. After her breakup with Willoughby, Marianne clearly thinks it's better to scream into the pillow. Without any desire or command over herself, she lets it rip. I must feel. I must be wretched. Many people would still agree that releasing our anger and frustrations makes us feel better. Better than bottling them up, right? Surprisingly, no. Researchers uh, and they mentions a, a university, found that when people are angry, giving them the opportunity to vent their anger by ruminating, ruminating means chewing the problem over and over, over the problem and punching something, actually makes them more aggressive, negative, and angrier than people who don't vent. A few exhausting pillow screams later, Marianne eventually reaches the same conclusion telling Eleanor, I saw that my own feelings had prepared my sufferings and that want of fortitude under them had almost led me to the grave. I compare my conduct with what they ought, what it ought to have been. I compare it with yours. Now I understand that phrase in the movie, I compare my conduct. She started to settle down. And, uh, and I have found, too, uh, we're taught by... I don't know, psychiatry or so, or society, that it's better not to, uh, you know, say anything about, uh, to be passive about everything and not say any, uh, that, that it's opposite of that, that it's better to vent. But when you vent, you can hurt a lot of people's feelings and you also are uh, rehearsing the hurt that went through you over and over and you really don't never get better it just rehashes itself and uh, so Mary uh, Eleanor had a, a kind of a, a conduct that was very dignified and Marianne couldn't figure it out and if you'll watch uh, Sense and Sensibility the 1995 or 96 edition you can see that so ladies I hope that uh, I hope that some of this is beneficial and that you got a few things done. Remember to watch this on my blog where I, I have a link there in the description box. Go there and you won't be uh, pestered by the ads, okay? So can I just read a little bit more because I have a few more minutes here. Courting negative thoughts is always a dangerous business in Jane's novels. This goes with all these poems I've read to you. Now, uh, this is a long video you will have to pause it just a little at a time it's just made for when you're trying to clean up the kitchen or do routine things that uh, are a little boring so you can always stop it and start it again courting negative thoughts courting negative thoughts I always wondered what uh, the scriptures meant when it said to take captive every thought it just meant uh, you don't let out everything that you think I think that's what it meant. But also, there was the old Greek uh, fable that we had to read and uh, that we had to have in uh, public school back in the 50s. And it actually had a pretty good message, and it was Pandora's box. And she was not supposed to open the box because it was full of evil thoughts. And once you opened it, all this, uh, it, there were cartoons drawn about it, you know, and you opened it, and here comes envy, here comes hatred, here comes. Um, unforgiveness and it's all floating around out there and you can't get it back in the box so once you tell somebody off uh, you might be you feel you're rid of it but then you've opened up a can of worms <laughs> uh, and ladies need to learn to uh, put people in their place in a polite way without insulting them too much so that it doesn't uh, make it feel like a uh, an accusation just a just an observation you know so the way that I would uh, say it is I have observed when you come here let's say for example you seem so tense you seem so and I'm feeling it in the house I'm trying to keep the atmosphere here very peaceful and calm and I, I sense your rush rushness and I sense your um, there's something about you that's very tense and uh, I, I just wanted to tell you about that because I would uh, 
rather you be happy. And uh, that's better than accusing someone. That's just ob observation. Courting negative thoughts is always a dangerous business in Jane's novels. It won't just ruin your happiness, it'll wreck your health. So if you've got somebody in your life that's doing stuff that that hurts you so bad uh, and you you start to, to nurture it and court it and think about it and all the time, night and day, it will wreck your health. And it's very hard once you get started thinking about something to to not think about it. So what you have to do is gradually let it go like it was an addiction. You just have to gradually let it go by substituting good things, by substituting self, they call it self-care, and all it means is um, being careful how you look after yourself. And anytime I, the, the friend I have that's into caregiving, she's a professional caregiver, caregiver says when people get stressed out, when they get to where they get a thought in their head that they that won't go away and they're obsessed with someone who has uh, done wrong to them or is doing something that uh, is is very worrying she says she can tell that they it's totally related to the amount of care they've given themselves they have not taken their walk they have not had their prayers they have not had their cup of tea they have not done their stretch little stretches or exercises they have not worked in their gardens they have not sewn uh, a dress that day. Of course, you know, some people can get so obsessed that they don't even know what they're doing. It can be quite bad for the brain. Um, which brings us to the biggest health horror of Austin world, stress. He goes on to talk about how stress was very evident in Austin's time. And uh, he talks about the, the sun that fell from a tree and the uh, mother whose daughter ran away with someone and didn't marry him right away and your income drops to near poverty and you're all going to be ending up having to live uh, on someone else's property or something and you're losing your house or just all this constant stuff and it says, ever since Jane was young, stress itself was viewed as the right and prerogative of the rich and well-off. They had more time to stress. I'm telling you, if you've got some cupboards to clean, if you've got a garden to tidy up, if you've got papers to go through, you start doing all that. And every time you have stress, go in and reward yourself and pay yourself by doing something that improves your uh, place that you live and improves life for you um, and don't let it disintegrate because then the people that are putting stress on you will visit you sometime and notice how clean your house is how you're not broken down in bed all the beds are made everything's the sheets are clean the towels are clean the bathroom smells wonderful you've been out and got some maybe new dishes or something for your home and so you reward yourself and stay stay positive and so ladies, I don't think I have another poem for you. I'll just flip through this real quickly and see if there was anything that I missed. And uh, so I wanted to read also, I noticed there was something here on goals. And there was an idea of when you have goals. And some of you that are homeschooling might want to know this. Or if you're just homeschooling yourself, define the goal. Many goals are hazy. Decide what you want out of life. I would say if you were raising children, decide what uh, kind of outcome you want. Generally, just generally. Uh, determine the necessary goals for attaining it and write it all down. And number two is dramatize the goal. Create a visual aid which reminds you of your goal. And this may be a picture or a special, uh, something other kind of special uh, thing and it could be maybe it's weight loss for you so you would have pictures of clothing that you hope to have or something like that now this is the one I don't agree with and it's called announcing the goal if you tell people about your goals see this was written a long long time ago but these days people uh, will thwart you so you wanna sometimes keep those goals to yourself uh, but you can tell yourself the goal so that you'll have something to live up to. The whole point of announcing the goal was to be accountable to somebody. Um, 
and let's say you have a goal of maybe being more patient and uh, if you announce that to someone and then you fail uh, that's not too good so probably best like I said before let's be more private and put a seal on our lips with some of the things that we talk about and then set up a definite program I like this organize a plan for accomplishing your goal usually it's wise to set a primary goal then a secondary goal and then other goals that can be reached in a shorter period of time write down these secondary goals and plans for carrying them out plan what you will do each month each week each day to reach your goals now I can understand that and so let's say you have a or I have a room I've got a garage that I've never really managed it the way I wanted it to be and it has a lot of things in it, it has seasonal things in it it has like a lot of the heavier blankets that I store in there in the summer which which we won't need it has uh, toys and it has craft projects and it has um, tools it has clothing it has so what I would and it has books and papers so what I would do is just divide it into categories one day will be bedding one day will be papers one day and I'll probably take something to listen to along with me an audiobook or a Jane Austen video that I don't need to watch because I just like the dialogue and I'll just work on it till I get one thing done and there will be uh, toys of different and then these are all divided into even lower categories there'll be children's uh, things and adult things and that sort of thing so I like that idea of breaking it all down into manageable uh, goals smaller goals so ladies I hope that this has given you time to get a few things done be sure and pause it and uh, think about things that I have said and you don't have to listen to it all at once and go to the blog to listen so you don't have to listen to ads I have heard that there are no ads when you listen on the blog so I will put that link there and um, stay close to Christ and be sure to do manage your preparation and get ready before you get started and um, and uh, so I'll see you next time. Bye.